mind is about to be blown with things that you can find and things you need to be looking for. And so I would like to introduce Dr. Dale Miles. Thank you. Well, I get you at the end of the day, huh? That's How many people have heard me speak before besides Don? Nobody? Usually I have one or two groupies in the... Nah, anyway. All right. I've got to ask a couple questions right off the bat. I put my bona fides up here. I don't know if you read them or not. I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can find... I'll show you a website in a second. If you want to hand out, or 30 of them, about comb beam CT, I've got at least 30 articles on my website. And I'm going to... This is going to sound really pompous and, and arrogant, but my website's called drcombeam.com. Okay, and the reason that's one of them, and the reason it is, is because the industry gave me that nickname. I've been lecturing in cone beam CT since 2005 when I left the dental school in Arizona, AT Still or ASDO, uh, to actually read cone beam full time. So I lecture, I consult. Uh, my office is in my study. I get a cup of coffee on the way, and that's my commute every morning, so uh, it's pretty nice. And by the way, what you're looking at here is actually my backyard, and so you can see it uh, more elegantly. I'll turn the lights down. Please don't go to sleep. I know you had some coffee during the, uh, during the break, so I know that you'll, you'll be okay. Isn't that gorgeous? Every night, every morning, because there's so much dust in the air in Arizona. <laughs> you put some cloud in there, you get great colors. All right, litany, practiced, I'm a American, by the way. I'm here legally. I, I became a U.S. citizen in Frankfort, Kentucky in 1999. I can talk like this the rest of the day. You want me to? <laughs> Anybody want, want to hear a lecture like that? No. No. Now, there's no, any, who's from the East Coast? Who's from New York or New Jersey? I know there's a bunch. Okay, there's only a few. There's no difference between the way a Canadian greets you and the way someone from New York greets you. Canadian goes, how's it going, eh? And the New Yorker goes, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Am I right? Forget about it. How you doing, okay? So, practiced for seven years in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. Did my grad work in San Antonio. Went to Halifax, Nova Scotia to teach for four years. Got bored. Knew that the, uh, the, the profession was growing bigger and quicker uh, in terms of radiology in the States. So, I, got re I, I was a visiting professor at UConn in Connecticut. I got recruited to be a graduate program director at Indiana University for 11 years where I had students in oral medicine and oral maxillofacial radiology. Recruited to Kentucky as a chair of half the school. Who, has, who does a lot of facial pain in here? Anybody? Do you know Jeff Okeson? He was in my department in Kentucky. I always love saying that because my graduate, you know, my colleagues back in Canada go, you know Jeff Okeson? I said, yeah, he was in my department. But I did staff Wednesday afternoons with Rennie Delu, one of his uh, protégés when I was there in Kentucky. They recruited me to the Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health because of my digital background. I'm a digital guy. I'm not quite as geeky as Dave up here, but I'm a digital guy, all right? So could I have those? Were you the light gal? Thank you very much. And I've got a couple questions. Do you want higher up here? Yeah, higher up here, just for now. It's just because we've got two parlors. Oh, okay. I want to ask a question. How many people in this room own a CBCT machine of whatever flavor? Keep your hands up. She's panning. I'm getting an audience response here. How many people in here actually get a formal radiology report for each of their scans? <laughs> We're down to two. Okay, all right. After you see this, you'll either want to take a lot more education in cone beam and or you might want to send them out to either a reading service like Beam Readers or an individual like myself. I'm your radiologist. I just practice in a different location, okay? All right? So here's the deal. Uh, I can't keep a job, obviously. Look at that, all those places. This is my website. There's my younger brother. <laughs> all right, you know, we all age. I got a haircut, you know. That was at the Hinman uh, Dental Meeting about six years ago. I'm going back this year. I've been twice since then, but I'm going back this year. And, they'll dress me up again because I'm one of those what they call featured clinicians. But I have an atlas. This is the second volume, by the way, second edition. First one sold out in three years, which is unheard of. Only book I ever made money on. This is an anatomy app called Scanatomy. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, 
you can relearn your anatomy being tested by Scanatomy, okay? So if you just go to the site, I don't sell it from here, I just, you just click and go to the, where we do, that's in the app store. Easy Writer, I have one owner in here. Where's Stuart, you in the room? No, he left. He came and asked me questions and then he left. Stuart Margolis is actually a per Mike. What is it? Oh, it's Mike, I thought it was Stuart. Yeah. Mike, are you there? That's his younger brother. Oh, that's your brother, younger oh. Brother, yeah. <laughs> hey, forget about it, no. <laughs> But he doesn't know how to use it yet, so I'm going to go visit him in the office. But it's a report and a decision support software. If you don't know what a tonsillolith, and I know you all do, okay, but if you click on it in the menu tab, you know, in the statements, it'll, it'll be a pop-up, and it'll show you what it is. So, and then on-demand 3D is probably the most powerful software in the world. Most of you don't have it because you have machines that, is, that are sold by Henry Schein and owned partially by Danaher so that you have an atomage, okay, many of you. Well, this is better software than an atom was, trust me, but I'll be showing you examples of that as we go through. So I used to do the, the lecture for the ADA on risk and liability for comb beam. I did it for five years, and what I said was, in the very opening, and I used to expand all this, I'm not going to bore you with that today, but this is really what you have to do when you adopt this disruptive and very elegant technology. You have to update your knowledge. I'm going to help you with that today. You have to look at data more critically because there's more stuff in the scan. It's not a single image anymore. It's 300 to 500 slices in three planes of anatomic section. That's a lot of data. Now, you don't have to scroll through every individual slice, but you have to have looked at it. You're going to make many more referrals. You're going to educate your patients more extensively because your patients, when you bring up those images, and some of you are doing it now, when they see them, they go, oh, my God, is that me? And you can show them things that they've... They, they didn't even knew exist. You're going to follow up your referrals more conscientiously because you're going to find more systemic stuff, which is what I'm going to show you. And you're going to produce more detailed reports. Now, in Ontario, Canada, where I got my license, that was uh, 100 years ago, I had my 40-year reunion about five years ago. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Um, the Royal College of Dental Surgeons of Ontario mandates that any comb beam wannabe owner has to take 30 hours of university-based CE before they can even get a certificate that allows them to purchase, okay? Now, I don't want to disparage my Canadian counterparts, but they're a bunch of Nazis in Ontario, okay? So I, I hate to say that, but they are. They have these amazing regulations. You can't own bigger than an 8 by 8 even an orthodontist can't own a volume, a machine that does larger than an 8 by 8 centimeter field of view. That's, that's unbelievably dumb, okay? So anyway, the reporting is why I made Easy Rider, because now the RCDSO, once they bought their machine and they're making all these scans, the RCDSO is going around the province and doing audits. And they're doing audits to see, show me your reports. There's certain things that have to be in it. Of course, they're all in the software that I produced, you know, because uh, I'm trying to help my colleagues out, right? But if you don't have it, they shut you down. They shut down your comb. You can't take any comb beams until you can actually show uh, several months of reports. So uh, you're, you're lucky we live here, okay? Even though I love my country, remember, I'm a Comerican, okay? So that's the current textbook. I do sections on risk and liability. And then this is... Uh, my good friend Bob Danforth and I did a dental clinics of North America and you can get the single issues, all 14 articles for free if you go in and click on boxes and download two or three at a time. If you want to know why you're getting errors in your scans, if you want to know what you should be seeing in your scans that you may have missed, it's all in that volume. It's a cool volume. I don't get anything for that. We, you know, we got like, I don't know, 1500 bucks or something up front to get all our friends together to write it. But it's a really cool volume. In it, I expanded a table, and what I'm going to spend a lot of time with you guys with today are plaques, okay, and not the ones you've been seeing or recognizing on your panoramics that everybody got all excited about. I'm going to show you a much more significant plaque. It's in the next layer of the artery, not the tunica intima. What's the next layer, class? Tunica? Very good. Biologic dentist. You get it, okay? You're not like my, some of my other colleagues. We're also going to spend some time in the uh, paranasal sinus area because there's things in there that'll just, again, they won't blow you away, but you're going to go, oh, crap, I've seen that. I didn't know what it was, okay? And a little bit of TMJ. 
But when you buy a machine, this is the first response when you're looking at the images. Turn it up. What the hell is that? What the hell is that? How did that thing be on here? Hey, come over here and look at this deal. This is where Murray got Carl from for Caddyshack. What the hell is that? <laughs> so that's two dentists looking at the images, right? All right. I'm sorry, but the first response I get when I, I'll ask the audience, I'll say, so, you know, when you first look at these images, you, did you know what you're looking at? No. You know, these images are great. What am I looking at? All right. So we're going to help you through that a little bit. By the way, the program that I do is a two and a half day program. I do it at national meetings. I'm doing it at the AGD. I was telling Dr. Margolis that I'm doing that in Connecticut this year. I'm doing it at the Hinman uh, Chicago Midwinter. I'm doing three of the five modules. I mean, I did it for Gordon Christensen for four, four years in a row now. Um, probably doing something similar up at LVI shortly. But in any event, the knowledge is getting out there. Why? Because the vendors don't tell you. Here's the other thing the vendors don't tell you. They don't tell you how to export your comb beam data volume, the DICOM data set, as raw DICOM. They teach you how to burn a CD, right, with a viewer on it. Well, that's proprietary. I can't open that using third-party software to read your scan. So DICOM was so we could share all this with the appropriate permissions. So when I get a, something up to my server to download and put in my software so I can make all the sexy images I'm going to show you, it's got to be in DICOM. And most of the vendors don't even teach you that. So let's just start real quickly with where we've gotten to, even with, sorry, even with digital panoramics. How many have a digital pan? How many just make their pan out of their comb beam? Don't do that. <laughs> uh, you can't get a good comb beam panoramic image. You can get some thin slice that looks good, looks a little different. But you can't give up 2D digital pan. It's just a too, too good a... a uh, modality. So you get all these things, okay? Let me show you, and I'm going to airway. This is what we're all worried about, right? The carotid plaque, diffuse carotid plaque in the airway area. You know, what, what, what happens at C3, C4 with the carotid artery? Here's the clue. See my, see my fingers? It bifurcates into the internal and external carotid, right at C3, C4. That's where you're going to see these plaques, but you're also going to see different plaques. You're going to see stuff like this. In an axial plane of section, you're going to see, and this is not the one-tenth of a millimeter slice image. This has had something special done to it, something every one of you have if you own a machine. It's called a MIP tool, M-I-P, Maximum Intensity Projection. And it's used by every radiologist to make calcifications look more prominent. And how you have to use it is you have to thicken the slice thickness out to about 10 millimeters and then push the MIP button and you'll get this. Now, do those not look like they're going around the arterial wall? They are. And they're bilateral. And we were all taught that things that are in multiple locations or bilateral, they're often systemic, right? Those are carotid plaques in a diabetic. Anybody have any diabetic patients in their practice? <laughs> If you didn't put up your hand, you got to leave, okay? So if you want to go back over your scans, first of all, you know, if you know a diabetic patient, if you can remember one from your fam family, you know, in, in your practice, pull up the scan if you've got one. Go to an axial coronal or sagittal slice. Look at C3, C4 area. Use that tool that when you finally find it, and you're going to see these. This is either undiagnosed diabetic or uncontrolled. And what's going to happen? What's, what's shutting down? What organ system is sort of shutting down when you see calcifications in arteries? No. That's here after all the chocolate and everything. What's, what's the first organ system to shut down in diabetes? Well, you get the vasculature, and what does that have? Kidneys, okay? Chronic kidney failure. Kid, the, diabetics end up on dialysis. Diabetics end up with what? Below the knee amputations, right? So if you see these, they're not under control or they're not diagnosed. They're that pre diabetic. Well, they're not pre diabetic. They got it. They just don't know it. So they need to get under control because if they don't, they're going to be below the knee amputees, you know, within a few years. 
So you'll extend quality of life, you'll get a diagnosis, you'll wake up the medical profession because they, we spend billions of dollars trying to reduce plaques in the interior of our arteries. You can have 90% of your arter arteries blocked and live to your 100. You could have 2% blocked and throw a piece and stroke out. There is no correlation between the degree of intimal calcification and death. And why isn't diabetes higher up on the causes of death? Because no coroner, okay, is going to sign a thing as a death certificate died of diabetes. No, it's cardiac failure. It's, it's the other things that are causes of death. And you're seeing the advertising come out now as to what? If you're a diabetic, you're at a higher risk of what? Cardiovascular disease and heart attack. Well, no shit, Sherlock. Pardon my... I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that if I offended anybody. No kidding, Sherlock. All right? So, yeah. So here's the deal. What you're looking for, and I want to just bang this into your heads today, is medial arterial calcification. And I'll show you the histology after that shows that these, are, these plaques are in the medial layer and they're circumferential. So if you see them going up and down an arterial wall or around an arterial wall and in there more than one location, it's a di diabetic, okay? And I'll show you the journal stuff for that. I've been following this since 1981 when I found 13 cases on 3,000 discarded panoramics of calcified facial arteries. And I've seen those on panoramics over the years. So I'll show you those at the end. So as a radiologist, and every dentist is their own radiologist, okay? You're responsible. You're practicing at the same level as I am, so you better kind of bone up a little bit, all right? You're doing surgery, right? So you're practicing the same level as a surgeon. You're doing endodontics, same level as a specialty that's an endodontist. So these are the tools, and this one in particular, the maximum intensity projection, is what I just said. Use it for all suspected calcifications, and basically you have to do two things. Thicken the slice thickness to at least 10. 10 is probably the perfect, and then apply the MIP tool. All right, enough said. So here's the digital pan. I get these all the time. What do you see in that area? Okay, well, let's blow it up for you, and now we could have those... I'll go do it. I need the exercise, my wife told me. By the way, best, best advice for losing weight, appliance or not, came from Lady Gaga. Did you know that? Move more, eat less. That's what she said on national television. How can you argue with that? <laughs> Move more, eat less, okay? So here's the area. Look at how beautiful it shows on these digital 2D pans. We're going to show you this stuff on comb beam, too. But I get these people ask me, well, is this a carotid plaque? No. Is this the bifurcation of the external and internal carotid artery? No. Can anybody tell me what that is? No? No? Oh, I got hyoid, I got clavicle. Anybody else? I didn't hear any other responses because I am going and getting old and going deaf. <laughs> All right, well... Let me show you what this is. First of all, that's the, that's the epiglottis, okay? This is the posterior lateral border of the tongue. Your hyoid, you've, you picked it out, but that's the hyoid. Doesn't it look like a hyoid? By the way, on these digital pans, you often see both arms. You, have, you often see both sides. We never saw that on, on film-based pans, okay? This right here is a thyroid cartilage. The blue part going up here is the superior, posterior superior horn of the thyroid cartilage, cartilage. It's suspended from the hyoid. And sometimes even that little suspensory ligament gets calcified, so it gets confusing. And this is the most boring structure. I'll probably put everybody to sleep. That's called the trititious cartilage. <laughs> now, it looks like a little calcification, because it is, OK? but it's totally normal. But the number of times I get somebody sending me a panoramic, is that a carotid plaque? You know, because everybody got excited about carotid plaques. By the way, they were always there. We didn't see them in film-based pans frequently because we didn't malposition patients too far forward, which brought those carotid plaques into the focal trough, okay? For all the dental assistants, they know what I'm talking about. You guys all delegate to them, right? All right, I'm using guys generically, all right? So, you get your first comb beam scan, you bought a small field of view, it looks like crap, first image you take. 
because the implants are failing, there's no bone support, you start scrolling through and you see that. And you go, oh my God, is that the bifurcation of the carotid arteries? No. <laughs> what is it? Thyroid. Thyroid cartilage, okay? If you don't know what it is, just call it that. It's an I don't know-ma, all right? <laughs> now you laugh, but if you see anything that you don't know and it's an I don't know-ma, that's when you refer. That's the standard of care, right? I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm going to send it to somebody who does. All right, Mass Effect, airway, you know, uh, Dawn was saying she was blown away. Well, I'll show you what's going to blow you away in a second. I can, you can look at grayscale things all day long. You're a dentist. We taught you radiographic interpretation. You need to move away from that. You bought a 3D CT machine with unbelievable capability. You need to be moving into color and 3D and surface rendering and I'm going to show you those things. But one of the things I can do, this is actually just a still frame out of the uh, an AVI video. If I see a mass, if I see encroachment upon the airway, I make an AVI video. I make it for my client. I put it up in the folder along with their report. The report has description, impressions, recommendation on the first page. You can't get away from it if they've got to be referred somewhere. And then images with arrows. Now, I got to tell you, cone beams don't come with arrows, okay? So you put the arrow on, you show the mass, but I can take it beyond that. In my client's folder, what I do for them is I make this. This is an AVI video, and I'm going down the airway, okay? Because I have a virtual, and there's your epiglottis. I can see masses. They're not in true color, of course. And there's your vocal cords. I can go all the way down the air, airway with this. So they get an AVI video. Do you not think that a patient seeing a big mass in their throat in a video where the doctor pauses at chair side and says, our radio, I love it when they say our radiologist, our radiologist found a mass and we're referring you to the ENT doc to scope, to get an you know, endoscopy to see what it looks like and what it might be. That may be why you're having difficulty swallowing. It may be why you're having the nodes swell up on this side of your neck. All right, so you, you have to relearn your anatomy, guys and gals. You have to relearn it. And the plane of section that you're uncomfortable with initially is axial, right? Cutting up from head to toe like this. That's how CAT scan got its name, computed axial tomography. Start when you're looking at your volume. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you real quickly later on how to review your volume. Start with a plane of section you're comfortable in, like sagittal. It's like looking at a bite wing or a PA or a CEPH, okay? Or coronal. Coronal's nice because it's like looking at the patient. I'm looking at Mrs. Jones just like I'm looking at her in the chair, except I'm looking inside her, okay? So these are the things I get. What's this? This little, they, they'll label it. Put an arrow, well, it's the same thing here, it's just not as prominent. It's the thyroid cartilage again. There's two arms of the hyoid. It's an average kind of panoramic. That's a typical referral that I get. There is the cartoon, your cartilage, there's the superior horn. The hyoid would be right in there. I didn't flesh it out all the way, but those are, those are the horns of the thyroid cartilage, for God's sake, okay? This is what they look like on a MIP image. How do I know? Because it says MIP. <laughs> And I did this at 20 millimeters. There's your hyoid. There is the, the superior horns. And look at how the ligament started to calcify there. So if you don't know that, you're never going to pick up carotid plaques. If you do 10 scans a week, if you've got a very active practice and you're doing 10 scans for various activities, you probably need to be sending them out. It takes me 20 to 30 minutes, 15 to 20 to go through the scan, another 15 to 20 to put the report together because I embed images and put arrows on them. And I do citations They're at the end. If it says, you know, typical citation, mastoiditis, it'll have a whole thing about mastoiditis and why you need to send it away. So you're going to look at these. And look how much prettier th these digital pans are than your comb beam ones. And you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you get a good one, but it's one in, one in 50, okay? You can do image processing in, in your 2D digital stuff, too. You're going to see, this is a MIP image, and, and when I first started to look at this, there were two or three calcifications on one side because it was a tenth of a millimeter slice. We thickened it out, did it bilaterally, and lo and behold, 
They're tonsillalis, fourth cause of malodor. Gut, periodontium, sinus problems, and tonsillalis, okay? All right, I'm going to skip through that. So, you're looking at your cone beam scan. You're in a central sort of area. You've got an axial plane of section. You see the airway, you see the uvula, uh, sorry, the epiglottis. You see a calcification there and there. These are probably tonsilloliths, but we don't know. This one's far enough over that it could be a submandibular parotid or sialolith, right? It's not quite in the right location to be parotid. But more commonly, you're going to see a lot of tonsilloliths. So just remember that's where you're looking, and you'll see them intraorally too. Boy, I had too much introduction there. All right. Tritatious. I've burned that into your memory banks now, okay? All right, so let's go on. Let's look at, oh, one last one. This is an MIP, maximum intensity projection. There's your hyoid, there's the cartilage from the thyroid, superior horn, and there's the tritatious. Makes it easy, doesn't it? But everybody's in thin slice gray. Oh, I can see this residual apical lesion on tooth number 10. Oh, I can see my implant site and measure it. You guys got to get out of your grayscale paradigm, or at least if you're in there, use these tools, this one and the color tool. Now, here's the deal. You get thin slice, that's what it's going to look like. You see a couple calcifications, or three there, two there. This is trapezius, by the way. This is a vertebral body, obviously, the posterior portion leading to the spinous process. You got to know all your vertebral anatomy, too, even if you only catch part of it. You got to know what a pedicle is. You gotta know what the articular pillar is. You gotta know these things because you're gonna see arthritic changes in there and separate them out from where the vertebral artery runs and some of these other problems. So, but look at this, same patient, MIP image. Okay, I'm gonna show you that again, so don't, don't worry. Let's, let's do something different. There's only two ways that junk can get out of your paranasal sinuses and your nose. You either gotta spit or swallow. There's no other way to get it out. And most women don't spit, right? Except if you're in the backwoods of Kentucky in a holler. I, I taught there, I know, okay. So where does it have to go? All of these sinuses are, they're all interconnected. Frontal, ethmoidal air cells, sphenoid sinus, which we don't see here, and maxillary. And look at the maxillary sinus. It's a dependent position, isn't it, for all fluids and crap to get to the bottom. It has to all get out of there up through the ostium, okay, a little opening into the middle meatal space. So it has to, this junk has to go up and over and then back and out. You've had a head cold, right? You've laid on a pillow and you can't talk and you sort of block both sides and you put your head down and about five minutes later you go, <gasps> that opens up and you go, oh, thank God I can breathe out of that side. And then a little bit later, and then also the inflammatory change in the tissues as well, you go this way and this side opens up. Well, all of that stuff had to get out. So ENT docs, by the way, is anyone, well, of course, who's from this area? Who's from the Valley area? Okay, have you ever heard Tim Hagen talk? Otolaryngologist? He and I lectured together at the Scottsdale uh, Study Club. He's amazing. He's teaching his ENT profession about the dental causes in the sinus, okay? Is it odontogenic, first of all? You guys are supposed to have ruled it out, but Sometime, and you know, ENT surgeons are just like dentists. They're not doing anything unless they're cutting something. <laughs> unless they're taking something out. They're doing surgery. Dentistry is a surgical discipline. This group is, 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 you know, at least cognitive for most of your diagnostic kind of side of things. Most dentists aren't. So if you show an ENT doc a bunch of stuff in the sinus, guess what they're going to do? They're going in. Now, they'll put you on a steroid, shrink it down, but they're going in. They're going to do FES, right? Functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Well, you know, there's other osteo, guys. It's not just that one. Any surgeons in here? Probably not. Or maxillofacial surgeons? No. You know, but they worry about this at post, post-surgery. You know, they do Laforts and things or do orthognathic surgery. They're worried about blocking the osteo because if you block this, everything can't drain, so you get a retrograde inflammatory change and infection sometimes because it can't get out. But there's other osteo, all right? Watch this. You know, and you, you and I, and I don't have to teach this group, you know, pathways for the conduction of all the impulses are shared between teeth and the sinus innervation. So 
Where's the ostium? It's a, it just means an opening. Here's the ostium, there's your middle turbinate. That's what they see in a nice, clean environment when they're looking through the scope. And they'll go up there with their endoscopy tool, they'll look inside and they'll go, huh, let's clean this out, then we'll expand if it needs expansion with a little balloon or whatever. So they do that stuff. They also have to go, by the way, to the other ethmoid air cells, sphenoid sinus, okay, they have to go there as well. So they'll do endoscopy and they take their tools and go up there. Because there's, there's openings between all of these. All right, so remember that. Ah, we won't even go there. <laughs> Lots of reasons. So you get your scan. It's a smaller field of view. You cut off sort of mid-orbit area. You look at this and you go, OMG, there's a lot of junk in that sinus. I had a, a wacko uh, graduate student. He was a non-traditional. That means he was an old guy when he came into the program, right? His name was Ted Parks. And he used to call these snotomas. I call it schmutz. It's a good term, schmutz, right? All right, so there's some schmutz in the patient's left antral space. The ostium is blocked. There's also, this is the inferior turbinate, middle turbinate. That inflammatory change went into that turbinate in a little pneumatized area that's very common called concha bullosa. What's another name for turbinate? Concha. <laughs> What's a bullosa? It's, you know, like a bullous lesion, it's a bigger... So that you can have an aerated central portion of the middle turbinate where you can get inflammatory change. Guess what it causes? Mid-face pain, neuralgic in character. Ooh, I got neuralgic pain, I'm looking for a Nico... Just kidding, guys, just kidding. Remember, I'm a radiologist and I believe, you know, I believe in all... Everybody... Oops, I'm sorry, I thought that was your foot. It may not be a Nico lesion unless you see something. With cone beam, you got a better chance, but it could be anything else. Oral facial pain is a tough diagnosis. A 16th century French physician, I think he was also a physician slash uh, Catholic priest. His name was Père Latham. Père means father in French. The diagnosis of disease is often easy, often difficult, and often impossible in the 16th century. Still true today. Okay, we're getting better, better tools, some more sensitive tools. But you can see the, the patent side is fine. The other one's blocked. You go in here, there's con a little, this is a lamellar type. The ENT people actually classify that pneumatization. There's lamellar, bulbous, and extensive, okay? Well, this is a lamellar type, probably was here too, inflammatory change in there. It's just like having a tooth that needs a root canal, but it's a cyst. It's not getting better because nothing can get in there. So in that case, if the patient's symptomatic and they've cleaned it, they may have to go in and clean out that concha bullosa defect as well. This is going a little further back. And by the way, if you see uh, things that look like bubbles in the, you know, within this mucosal change in a space, no matter where it is, do you know what the ENT people call those? Bubbles. <laughs> This isn't brain science, okay? They call them bubbles. It's air and mucin interface. It sometimes signifies, though, an active process, you know, an acute phase rather than a chronic phase, okay? From a radiologist's point of view. So this is the same patient. We're looking, by the way, this is still part of the maxillary sinus, but we're into the ethmoid air cell complex as well. This is the sphenoid sinus. So that change in the, in the maxillary sinus has gotten into the middle part Here's the lamellar concha bullosa and a bigger one here, probably inflammatory change that's caused that expansion. But it may not have been all from, you know, may not have been all from just asthma, hay fever, allergy, sinus infection, lots of odontogenic things, as you know, you've seen them. And this is what Tim teaches, you know, his ENT colleagues. We got a lecture together again because he was wonderful to lecture. He had such great cases, and then when he saw my case, you got some good stuff too, dude. You know, it's like yeah. So here's the sphenoid sinus. This is the, the what's called clivus, means slope in Latin of the sphenoid bone. And there's some schmutz in the sphenoid sinus, and there's the ostium. This one hasn't, you know, gotten out of there. The, it's established in the sphenoid sinus. That is the most misdiagnosed problem in ENT is a sphenoid sinusitis, but there is a classic headache and referral pattern that occurs with a sphenoid sinusitis. Does anyone know where it refers to? This group should know. Sorry? Neck, no. 
It's the most unusual pattern. If you have a patient that complains of a headache and you say where, and they go right on the top of my head. High index of suspicion for a sphenoid sinusitis. Second suspicion I have is fungal in origin. And you'll ask the patient a history, they'll say, oh yeah, they put my antibiotics all the time. Do they work? Well, for a little while, and then it comes back. Well, no kidding, Sherlock. See, I didn't say it this time, did I? No kidding, Sherlock. It's fungal in origin. How do they know? Well, they got to go and do culture. They got to get a specimen from in there. But if it's established and you have that referral pattern and you see schmutz in the sphenoid sinus, there's a couple other radiographic signs, but I won't be showing you those today. I'm doing the Cliff Notes, Cliff Notes version, okay? In Canada, it's Coles Notes, right? Remember those? Eh? I never read them. <laughs> never read them. <laughs> so, you know, you can have mucus retention cyst or antral pseudo, so whatever you want to call it, but there is an opening. So these things share pathways. Now, here's a kid. How old's this kid? Based on the six year molar. Almost finished, right? Not five. Comes in at six, finishes three or four years later, so they're nine going on ten, somewhere in there, all right? Do they have a sinus problem? Yes. Yeah, because you're a dentist, so you're used to looking at the maxillary sinuses, right? That's, where you're, that's your baby, that's where you live. So here's the maxillary antra, totally chock full. Here's the axial cut midway up. You can see that the sinuses, yes, have a bunch of schmutz in them. You can see the developing uh, adult cuspids. This is the turbinate. There's inflammatory change around it. How do I know? Because it's blocked these meatal spaces. This kid can't breathe, and this kid has headaches. And what's, what's their history going to be like? Not very good. Mommy, my head hurts. Where? Everywhere. That's about what you're going to get, too. And here's the deal. No child, unless it's a suspicion of a childhood tumor, okay, should ever have CT, conventional medical CT. They should have cone beam first, and that's why ENT docs are buying these machines. Why? Because the dose from a typical cone beam machine to a child with a developing thyroid, okay, the only organ system we worry about in, in kids and or adults, and adults are pretty stable, you're not going to get much change, but in a developing child, we protect it. Well, here's the deal. When they, when they get a dose from a cone beam machine, it's between 12 and 120 microsieverts. <coughs> Don't worry about the units. Only my Canadian colleagues know what the hell a sievert is, okay? And they worry about them. They really worry about them in Canada. You know what a conventional medical CT is in terms of dose in microsieverts? 2,100. So 2,100 versus 120. So the first pass at a kid with, with sinus problems should be cone beam. And it might even be in your office. And if you catch, a, you know, you're looking for tooth development or a, a supernumerary or a pro, some teeth that didn't develop and you take a cone beam and you see schmutz in the, in the maxillary sinuses, you might want to characterize them all. Take another cone beam to show them all if you have a small field of view. If you have a big field of view, you're going to look in the other spaces and see them, make a nice referral. And that's why ENT is buying them. Now, that doesn't mean that kids don't get CT and MR when they have clinical signs and symptoms of something more, you know, ominous, all right? Now, look at this kid. Maxillary sinus is totally occluded. Ethmoid air cell complex is blasted, okay? Anybody in here know the referral pattern for ethmoid sinusitis? It's a patient with a headache, and they say, where is it? Right there, behind my eyes. They'll say retroorbital. They won't say retroorbital. You will say, because you know that language. But they'll point right between the can't middle, middle uh, medial canthus, they'll go, oh, I get a headache, it's right there. And you still have the same, you know, stomp positive and postnasal drip rhinorrhea, you still got the same things, but that's the referral pattern. Of course, maxillary is, you know, you palpate the maxillary sinus or the frontal, but here's a way to percuss, I, I don't know if you were taught this or not, we used to teach it in our grad program, to percuss the maxillary sinuses, just like your physician does your back, Try this in your seat. Put your index finger on an infraorbital rim. Take two fingers of the other hand and tap. Feel the bone conduction? No, tap, end on, not, not tap. That's a microaggression if you do it. No. <laughs> you can feel the bone conduction, and they will go, ow. All right? 
Okay. That's the oral medicine side. I don't get to lecture much in that anymore, but I will. But here's a dentist. He sends me this picture and this picture. And he says, what is that? And we look, and we look, and we look, and myself and two general dentists both said, don't worry about it. It's an antral pseudocyst. It's not anywhere near the ostium. Just watch it. Periodic radiographic follow-up. That's still treatment, by the way, guys. You don't have to cut anything, okay? <laughs> Periodic radiographic follow-up. Good diagnostic test. So he wrote me an email, and he's an implant. I, I, I know a lot of the lectures in North America, and this is a big lecture, and he, I say, can I, can I show him your email? He says, yeah, just don't tell him who I am, okay? So here's the email he sent. Believe it or not, those are quick captures I took out of VIP, which usually doesn't give a great image. The new version's much improved. Scared the crap out of me, as this has been the implant patient from hell. Smoker, then diagnosed diabetic after treatment started. Have to admit, I got so tunneled vision on the noble guy and setting up the lower. When the colleagues saw the image I posted, said, what's that large egg-shaped object in the sinus? I hadn't even bothered to look. Nothing like taking the time to do advanced imaging and gather all the data so we can ignore it. <laughs> I can't make this stuff up, guys. I mean, that just says it all, doesn't it? Why? Because we're dentists first. We're task-oriented. We're focused. So when a machine manufacturer puts up an image, what do they show you? I, don't, I, I thought I had it here, but I have it a couple slides later. They give you the central image of the axial plane, the central image of the coronal plane, and the central image of the sagittal plane. And down over here in the right corner, you might have a stylized you know, 3D image. It might be a pseudo-hologram grayscale thing or a colored image. So what do you do? In all your damn software, you drag those little bars over, right, to the implant site or the endo, the, you know, the root canal area at the apex, and you go for it. You focus. Oh, look what I'm finding. What did you just do? You forgot to look at the rest of the volume. You have a responsibility. You wouldn't look at half a panoramic. You wouldn't look at only one bite wing when you take two. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have an obligation, and you can't abrogate that. You can't sign it away. You can't have the patient sign an informed refusal. I won't even get into that. I need to come back. To, I was telling Don, I need to come back to this group and spend two hours with you on risk and liability somewhere, okay? Because I can show you many more cases. I've got 13 expert witness cases on the go right now. Not, not all related to comb beam necessarily, but certainly the imaging in it. So here's my suggestion. If anybody wants to take a picture of this screen and you don't get it any other way, get it. Look at the entire volume first. Do not go to your task. Pick a plane of section you're comfortable with, okay? What I would suggest is coronal or sagittal when you're first starting out. If you're confused, look at another plane. If you're confused, make a 3D image. The number of times, I'll, I'll, if I leave myself enough time, I'll open up the software, I'll show you how quickly and easily you can make a 3D image when you're confused. And we're all confused a lot, all right? If it's questionable calcification, make that MIP image. Capture screenshots, start making those screenshots, you know, capture them as you go because they're, they're gonna go in your practice uh, management software in your patient's record. They're also going to be what you use to maybe make chart notes or narrative or, uh, heaven forbid, a formal report, you know, uh, of that patient. When you've looked at all the planes of section, start the report. I don't care if it's a narrative. I don't care if you're telling your dental assistant, okay, write this down. There's a large ovoid, blah, 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 okay? But do it. Then go to your task. If you don't, if you don't force yourself to do this, you're going to miss things. Patient gonna die? No. Could the patient get harmed? Sure. Could you get sued? Absolutely. Okay, so you've got a responsibility. Easy for me to say, you know, dentist or task, here it is. This is what you get, right? I never look, in my software, I never look at 3D. I never see this. What I do is I open it up in a different module of the program that I can click up here on this, uh, there's a little box up here there's axial, coronal, sagittal, and it only brings up one plane of section at a time, and I scroll through all of those, capturing screenshots as I go, making a 3D if necessary, then I go to the next plane. If I get confused, I look at a different plane of section, but I go back, okay? All right, so I'm not gonna, don't do that. I'm gonna, you've seen these things on your panoramics all the time. If there's no cortical margin, it's probably, if there's an air soft tissue interface, it's an antral pseudocyst or a mucous retention cyst. 
If it's not anywhere up higher up, you're not going to have to worry about it. But this would have been on a panoramic a mucus retention cyst, but it's got little ears on each side. We only saw it on a pan because pan images are stacked up, so we're not really seeing reality. This is reality, and when you do 3D, that's even better reality, okay? Not for a mucus retention cyst, but this is how you might see it. This is a reconstructed pan, one of the better ones out of the comb beam stuff, and you can see a little, this is probably dense bone island or anastosis, some root canal procedures. You see this crud in the sinus and you wonder why. Well, the beauty of it is you can put it in a different plane of section or make a pseudo thin slice comb beam and you can see why. That's there because there's an opening into the, into the sinus cavity. It's an AO defect. You did the extraction, right? No, I'm just kidding. Somebody else did the extraction. <laughs> All right. Here's the case. And I, I, this isn't her, but I had to show you this. This is the excited, this is a small field of view. I don't know why they went back to take this area of the anatomy. Maybe they were trying to capture the sphenoid sinus, you know. They, they heard me lecture and they had a small field of view, but they thought, oh, I could better go look there. I'm just, te I'm just pulling your leg, all right. So this is clivus. There's the sphenoid sinus. Does anyone, can anyone tell me what C is pointing to? Y'all, who has comb beams again? <laughs> Sorry, I won't ask. Anyone know what that structure is? Atlas. Sorry? Atlas. It is. Smart guy here. You better elect him next year. Oh, just kidding. You're already <laughs> elected. President elect, right? Yeah. This is Atlas. Is Atlas a big vertebral body? Why the heck do you think they call it Atlas? <laughs> it holds up your head. C1 is Atlas. Okay, what's C2? Axis. Axis. So, where's Axis? Well, it's here. Thin slice, grayscale, ooh, look at those periapical lesions I see. You want to see what they really look like? Watch this. This lady was having, oh, sorry, this lady was having full mouth extractions. Okay? She was partway through healing. She had an AO defect. And when I was doing the 3D reconstruction, I just click, pull out the thing, click again, I make a 3D. There's Atlas. Look at the size of that puppy. Can you appreciate that from this? No. no. Get out of your grayscale once in a while. You bought a machine that gave you tools. Learn to use the tools. Teach your assistant or your hygienist to use the tools. You're going to see stuff. Okay? So let's go into the AO defect thing. I mean, look at the size. Of that. And there's the dens, by the way. See the odontoid process right here? There's at Atlas. There's Axis. It's called lantoaxial junction. By the way, I see tons of loose bodies right in that area that which could give you referred pain, just like a loose body in the temporomandibular joint complex. So I labeled it up for you, okay, because it'll come out in the presentation. But here's what she looked like in the thin slice stuff. This gave us information too. She's missing a part of the lateral wall in the right maxillary sinus. She's missing the floor. She's got some schmutz. She, you can see it in coronal. That's probably the easiest and nicest plane to look at for paranasal sinus stuff. But I can't leave it there. You know, I'm a 3D guy, right? So here are their lips. This is sagittal. This is called a slab rendering. It means thickening out the slices, clicking on a template. You got it easy. You guys have it easy. There are templates that you can pick, bone and soft tissue, soft tissue only, blah, blah, blah. Hunt around your software, you'll see it. I helped create many of them because I've been working beta testing for one of the companies, and then I see all these templates end up in other machine software, OK? We would actually assign color, transparency, and, and opacity to each of these volumes and get these fancy images. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at the I-10 <laughs> or I-95 on the East Coast. That's the, that's the fistulous tract going up into the maxillary sinus where all the bacteria are going up and down. How frickin' cool is that? I heard a speaker this morning use the word frickin', so I can use that, all right? Okay, so I thickened it out a little bit more. There's the hamulus, just to clue you in. Sometimes they're scattered. By the way, this is my ROI. If I said ROI to you guys, what do you think of automatically? It's like Pavlov, return on investment. I'm a dentist, return on investment. No, in radiology world, it's region of interest. And so I'm not, that's not making that up. That's what they call it. And you'll have x-ray techs truncate the data down to the region of interest so that the radiology can quickly look at it from an ER and say, yep, fracture, yep, you know, tumor, yep, whatever. 
They don't even look at the entire volume. That might go out to overnight and be looked at to make sure nothing's missed. So here's a, you know, I did a 3D kind of thing of the pan, and you can see there's the opening right there. I love this, this one, though. There's the lining around the inferior turbinate. There's where it communicates with the sinus. There's the tract. There's the tract looking up into it, and there's the tract. How cool is that? Very cool. Thank you. All right, I'll do this one quickly. Full mouth, uh, full mouth, four third molar extractions, post-operative pain. You can see the extraction sites, but you can see stuff in the maxillary sinuses. You can see, what are these called, class? Bubbles. Okay. The right antral space is almost totally occluded. You go higher up, more bubbles, still, look, still looking bad. Just showing you some anatomic structures, trying to do all my two days in one. That's where the inferior belly of the lateral pterygoid would be, coming off the pterygoid plate, going to the pterygoid fovea and the condylar head. You can see them sometimes. But this guy had a roaring unilateral pansinusitis. This and this are actually the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. Just below them are the lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid plates. But you're not used to seeing this. This is not in your paradigm. We never taught you this in dental school. I had to learn this after dental school, okay, in my graduate program and elsewhere. So they've got a little bit of inflammatory change, a lot of stuff here, and his pain with postoperatively had nothing to do with his extractions. He had basically a, a concomitant, you know, a unilateral pansinusitis that was in an active phase. There's the lateral pterygoid, there's the medial. All right, so blah, 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 all right. Another case, 60-year-old white male, and he snores. So, you know, his wife sent him in to you guys <laughs> okay, to make an appliance or look at why is he snoring. Well, <laughs> he's having breathing problems. They don't just come from your airway. It's just, just soft tissue at the back of your throat all the time. This guy's got it. And by the way, see these thickened walls? Normally, they look thin. If it's thickened, we call that hyperostosis. If there's thickened hyperostotic sinus walls anywhere or ethmoid air cell complex, it means that puppy's been there for a long time. Body's trying to wall it off, laying down, you know, converting the osteoclast become blasts or whatever in the way they go. By the way, the sphenoid, si the sphenoid bone, this is all sphenoid. There's, this is thickened around these areas that have inflammatory change in them too. There's the ethmoid air cell complex, and you remember the sphenoid sinus has an osteum that leads into that. There's the sphenoid sinus. It's worse on the patient's left side. Okay. More. And by the way, probably the most important area. Oops. Sorry. Not supposed to do that. This is the sphenoid sinus. See this little round area here and round area here? What do you think that is? Very good. Was that? Oh, my God, Dr. Meyer. I'm going to come and practice in your office. That's the groove for the carotid artery. As it comes up, comes medial, up again, and then goes into the you know, circle of Willis and Basler. So you're going to see calcifications in there. And if they're circumferential and they're bilateral, you're thinking diabetic, OK? So here's, this was a, a godsend. I got several of these kind of cases. This one came to me, and I'm looking at this, and I'm going, what the heck? What is that? What is that? Yeah. What the hell is that? No. So, so they've got a bilateral, at least maxillary sinusitis, probably pan sinusitis, and this little puppy right near the condyle. Guess what that is? That's a carotid artery, too. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. So they got a bunch of stuff going on. They got things in the sphenoid sinus. But this guy also had, these are the mastoid air cells, a little uh, sort of posterior to the temporomandibular joint region, of course. If you see inflammatory change there, that might be the source of the patient's pain. A mastoiditis, current or previous, because they just stay opacified sometimes, but with a, a concomitant or a, an accompanying Middle ear infection, what do we call that? Otitis media, okay? So when mastoid air cells are infected,
basically, you know, you get a, a, a often or frequently an otitis media with it. So you don't want to be this person. You want to educate your patient. You want to look at your scan. You want to make the proper referral so you don't get caught like this. You're the next clinician that's come along and this patient has a complaint. My asthma. They said they'd fix it, but it didn't make any difference at all. Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Nope. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? Ladies, I promise I'm not a misogynist, okay? But that is, it doesn't work if it's a guy, does it? You know? Anyway, because we splash it on. You know, we do this, right, with our cologne. All right, so, you know, you know all about overuse of antibiotics for years and years. When I'd have the patient with the achy teeth, and I don't think it's your teeth, I think it's your sinuses or some hay fever or whatever, they didn't go on an antibiotic. We'd do the percussion, we'd do all the dental things, rule it out and I'd put them on an antihistamine. And I used to use plain old Benadryl. I'd say, you're gonna be sleepy at night, you're gonna have a dry mouth, but I bet your teeth won't ache the next time you come in. Nine times out of 10 they come back, doc, you're right, my teeth don't ache anymore. And I'd go see your ENT doc. And remember, I didn't have comb bean. You know, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, our oral medicine clinic was called the mouth clinic for the public. If you had a problem with your mouth, where'd you go? You went to the mouth clinic, right? So. Sinus lesions, wait till I show you these. This is a wake up call for you. I'm not gonna show you tumors and osteoma, they get very frequent, I showed you AO defect. I wanna show you this, what do we call this? That's a mucosal, that's a dentist, minor salivary gland, severed extra, extravasation of the mucin into the surrounding tissues, elevated, vesicle, okay? I had a resident in my oral medicine program who was from tai, Ch tai Chung Veterans Hospital. He was an oral maxillofacial surgeon and he staffed, he was a senior resident in his final year there. He had 30 residents working for him as a senior resident, okay? He dissected one of these out intact. And Chuck Tomich, one of the pathologists, came running down the hall and said, who did that dissection? Who, who did the biopsy? Philip. He said, we've never, in, in, in 75 years of the biopsy service, we've never had one come back intact. He blunt dissected it out. <laughs> All right, now here. This is a ENT mucosal. Same stuff inside, okay, uh, uh, as your maxillary sinus changes, the inflammatory stuff. But if it's in the frontal ethmoidal complex is the most prime area. Now this patient's obviously compromised somehow. It's displaced the orbit, it's expanded. When you see the mucosal change, but you see dehiscence of the walls, or you see perforation, or you see expansion of a space, it's a mucosal, okay? An ENT mucosal, not something on your lip. So this is a non-enhanced uh, conventional CT. You can see one in the ethmoidal complex, and you can see it's pushing out into the orbit. Wouldn't it be nice to catch it there, rather than there? Okay, well, you got comb beam, guess what? Oh, here's the ENT, I love this. I heard this guy lecture at our radiology meeting. It was in San Antonio and he said, a mucosal is not a problem until it's a problem. <laughs> They're quiescent, they don't cause any major pain until they start to destroy stuff, okay? So, I'm gonna stay there, but here, soft tissue density, expansion of the sinus, Evidence of bone thinning and erosion, and you see it on CT. Well, dang it, you see it on comb beam, too. How do I know? Because I've seen them. I'm going to show you a couple of cases. So 60% of frontal ethmoidal area, all right? So you're, look, you're going to capture the ethmoid air cells. You'll sometimes, and by the way, they, there's a lateral recess of the frontal sinus that communicates with the ethmoids. Here's what I found. And my validation was this. I'm, I'm, I'm actually building a, with a neuroradiologist colleague out of Virginia, Chris Smith, we're building a cloud-based reporting system. And here's what we're trying to talk the manufacturers into. You buy a scanner, you get a report. Why? When you push the button, the data comes to the cloud to us. 
you don't even have an option. You just get the report back within five to six business days. So that's what we're working on right now. Because down the road, we're going to use all that data to do even fancier things. But I get this picture. And Chris and I are on our FaceTime all the time, probably twice a week. So I get my iPhone out. I revert, you know, I'm, I get it. And I say, Chris, I want to ask you what you think this is. And I bring it up. And I just get it in focus. And he goes, mucus seal. And I went, yes. <laughs> One in a row, you know. Oh, come on, that was funny. You know, in my mind, I knew it was, but I needed validation. I needed somebody smarter than me. There's lots of people smarter than me to go in there and say, yep. See how it's expanded? The, the, this little thin bone against the medial wall of the orbit is called the lamina papyracea, and you can see it. They've encroached upon it, okay? So that's in a, 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 a large ethmoid air cell, and it's expanding. Again, wouldn't you want to get it treated there? rather than when it's a problem. That's what it looked like from the axial plane of section. This is a different case. You can see this doesn't look circular. It's kind of tall and ovoid, but it's doing the same things. It's expanding those air cell areas. And it did the same thing. It's encroaching upon, this is actually the inferior turbinate. There's the middle turbinate. It's kind of a thin one, but it's expanding there. So these are mucus seals. You've got to know about these now. Do you have to diagnose it? No. Do you have to look at an expansion and say, hey, that looks odd. It's a what? An I don't know, right? What are you going to do? You're going to refer. Okay. So this one, I've got to tell you, I, some of you use this service. And they're good friends of mine. And I, there's cases I've missed stuff on, too. And then we get it back. And we do our quality assurance. And we shore up our, our systems. But this was missed. This was a, a legal case that I was, you know, asked to, to, to read on, and it was an implant in a canal. Well, it was in the canal, all right? Both of we radiologists agreed on that, but the senior radiologists reading for beam readers, one of them, missed that completely. They also missed this, which freaked me out. Total absence of, you know, the posterior arch of C1, at least from there to there. This is the, looking from the back, there's the dens. So the first time I found that, I missed one. How did I miss one? Thin slice. When you look at thin slice data, it doesn't give you reality. So I got a, a client. He's in Nanaimo. He's an orthodontist. Alexis David gives me a, phones me up. Hi, Dale. I got your report. Uh, he said, uh, thank you, blah, blah, blah. What did you think of the posterior arch of C1? And while they're talking, I'm pulling up the report, right? On my, on my workstation, I look and I go, obviously, I didn't think anything of C1 because I didn't have anything reported. So I said, well, give me a minute. I, I brought it up in the software, and I made a 3D, and I said, oh, my God. He goes, yeah. The, you know, it's, it's very similar to this. And come to find out that anomalies of C1, C2 are quite common, including this one. Now, is the patient's head going to fall off? No. There's some tissue between there, but it's just not osseous. There's probably connective tissue. Maybe they walk around. No, I'm just kidding. All right, antralis, any foreign body in the sinus, you're going to see all kinds of those. Don't worry about them. Sometimes you're the cause. You know, there's the foreign body, there's the inflammatory response, been going on a long time. All right, why? Because somebody created an AO defect and pushed some, some super schmutz up in there. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of things going on. You're going to see those. There's your typical concha bullosa, lamellar, bulbous, okay? This is often a cause of what? It's often a cause of a deviated septum. So if you're doing airway stuff, you know, everybody would pick out a deviated septum. Now you've got to teach yourself that these are the inferior turbinates, these are the middle turbinates, and that doesn't have to be treated. It's just there. You need to look at it and see it. But if there's inflammatory change in the other paranasal sinus spaces, the next place it's going to go is right there. Okay. Oh, yeah, I love this. You, you've got patients that, well, what seems to be your problem? I've got chronic sinus, <laughs> you know, like I've got TMJ, right? So they've got, this guy had mid-face pain. He's got tremendous, you know, uh, changes in both the maxillary uh, antra or sinuses, ethmoid air cell complex, frontal sinuses as well. But he had a big concha bullosa too. And I'm going to show you, this is the classification, lamellar bulbous extensive 
treatment for the extensive ones. First, to remove the pathologic contents. Second is to alleviate the nasal obstruction. Third is to facilitate visualization of the complex during endoscopic surgery. You know what they do? They go in with the scope, they break the uncinate bone. They just fracture it going on up. It doesn't, doesn't cause any post-operative problems, apparently, but they, they have to get it out of the way. And then the fourth is to treat the middle meatus obstructive syndrome results in neuralgia and pressure. So if you have a patient that's complaining of stuff like that, and you've got comb beam and you've got those images, you might be the guy to see it or gal. It might just look as simple as this. This one probably is totally asymptomatic, subclinical. There's another one with some inflammatory change just in there. Nothing else much going on. So who knows, but you're going to see them. It's reportable. By the way, what's this little thing? Ah, it's a torus. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm smart but I have people I can go to. This will be, I, th I think you're gonna love this one. Yeah, you're gonna have to turn this one up, okay? I'm glad you can make it. Can I get you a drink? Yeah, something soft, I'm driving. Parking's an absolute nightmare around here, isn't it? I have to reverse into the tiniest of spaces. Still, I managed it. I mean, parking's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> and I should know. <laughs> Why is that? Are you a doctor? Careful. Not a doctor. I'm a brain surgeon. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, I actually know a joke about this. What's the difference between a doctor and a brain surgeon? One's not exactly brain surgery. The other is brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you guys do? I'm an accountant. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I could do with an accountant. Filling in those tax forms can get really confusing, can't it? Still. Still. It's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> I mean, brain surgery, believe me, is very complex. Are you an accountant too? Uh, no, I work for a charity. Oh, that's a very selfless job, isn't it? I really admire you. I don't think I could ever do what you do. <laughs> I say that because it's emotionally draining, not because it's hard. <laughs> I mean, it's not exactly brain surgery, is it? <laughs> Which, as a brain surgeon, is what I do. Lionel, here's your drink. Lionel's a brain surgeon, you know. <laughs> yeah, he mentioned it. <laughs> oh, Jeff, they keep you late at the Space Centre. As always. Late from the Space Centre. Have you met Lionel? Uh, no, hello, Lionel. <laughs> so, Jeff, how do you earn a crust? Uh, oh, I'm a scientist. I, I work mainly with rockets. It's, <laughs> it's um, pretty tough work. Um, what do you do? Why? I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery? <laughs> Not exactly rocket science. Isn't it? <laughs> I'm here till Friday. Oh, wait, it is Friday. All right. This show. Mitchell and Webb look is, is just brilliantly done. Now, not all of them are up to that level, but it's a reminder to me. There's always people smarter than me. I've got go-to people. One's at the Cleveland Clinic. He's a DDS, MD, oral maxillofacial radiologist, medical radiologist, and, and I've got two or three of those friends. So, All right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on TMJ. Some of you are brighter than I am in this, but I want to show you this condyle and a few others. Is that not like the sexiest condyle you've ever seen? You know, we're always looking at open clothes, thin slice, how far did it go? A lot of times the symptomatic joints don't have big osseous changes, you know, osteophytes or, or whatever. But when they do, when, isn't it nice to be able to see it in 3D? I mean, we look at these kind of, of, of sections, you know, you can see that there's loss of joint space on this side, there's a subchondral cyst or maybe a surface erosion subchondral sclerosis, so you get some information, right? But you can also look in 3D. I mean, you can see the surface erosion. It doesn't look like just a cyst anymore, or an osteophyte, there's lipping is, is the term, and then a, a surface erosion. So you can see lots of them. The hallmarks of degenerative joint disease, which is primarily what you're gonna see. Uh, the rheumatoid arthritics don't come in as frequently, although connect, connective tissue disorders you see periodically, of course like progressive systemic sclerosis and those things. But, you know, you're looking for joint space narrowing, uh, osteosclerotic change, osteophytic change, and also subchondral cyst formation. And these are what you're looking for, okay? A joint is a joint is a joint. 
I mean, the, the temporomandibular joint is loaded. It's almost like the knee. Now, people ask, can you see the disc? No. Will you be able to? I, I never say never now, okay? Never. I've got a friend, Roberto Moltini, who used to work for Gendex for 25 years in Chicago. He's an Italian physicist, okay, high-voltage physicist. He's working for an Indian company now. He moved back to his family home in Verona, but he's working with them on a soft tissue comb beam machine, which sounds very unique. So uh, never say never. There's the inferior belly, superior, partly into the disc to coordinate the movements. I've on occasion thought I've seen soft tissue, but not usually. This is a deep pterygoid fovea. This is what we call lipping. Lipping is not my term. Lipping is a good medical term. Uh, I'm going to show you some of that in a second. You can see that this guy is opening. He's translating quite a bit. He's almost to the end of the articular eminence. The opposite side, not quite as much. So grayscale information does give you... And you can measure that. You can put your little measurement tool on there and measure to within a tenth of a millimeter. And there's no distortion in these images. These images are all rendered in whatever machine in one-to-one -one ratio. Yes? Because you're scrolling from one side only. And you know it in the software when you're looking. So you start on the patient's left side and you scroll to the right. If I did a 3D rendering, you'd be looking at the medial surface on this side. Okay, so, yeah, that's a good point. You, I know, you're a doc. You want them facing each other, you know, for comparison. Well, if you, if you saw what I did, whoops, wrong one. You can still do that. Okay, in any of the programs. So that's right, that's left. Okay. You also see that in the assignment. Yeah. So I've got to show you how you can get tricked, though, in grayscale. Subchondral cysts, loss of joint space, not much translation. Put it in a different plane of section, yep, that still looks like a subchondral cyst. And it's thin slice, that's why you don't see all the condylar head. By the way, that's the foramen ovale. When I teach you the anatomy, we learn all those again. That's where the trigeminal comes out and goes into the mandible. Makes sense, doesn't it? A little further medial, you'll have the foramen lacerum and the internal carotid comes up, past the condyle, goes here and up. So we'll see that in a second. But let's go back to the condyle. Now I put it in this kind of view and you can see that this one looks like a little loose body in the joint space. Well, it was none of those. It was how we sliced it up. Our modalities only gave us so much information. We had to do radiographic interpretation. I got into about a 30 minute argument with my Scandinavian friends. I, we were in Budapest and I was given a lecture. Guess what the lecture was called? Dif it was called Radiographic Changes of the Temporomandibular Joint, 35 Years of Rorschach Tests. <laughs> you like that one? I got a hundred of them. No. <laughs> I got one called the Rocky Horror Implant Show. That's a three-hour talk, okay? What happens is, in these thin slices, and even with tomography, you cut through the condylar surface. So this is what looked like a loose body, and it may be someday. But this is just lipping, which is, happens on hips and other bones, and this is a deep pterygoid fovea, okay? So you can see what it looks like, bilateral comparison, slab rendering, it's called. By the way, you know, I'm not trying to sell a book, but if you buy the book, I take you through thin slice, slab, full thickness, all the planes of section, and it's an atlas. It's not academic. It's an atlas. It's, here's the, the preliminary stuff for two or three chapters, including the anatomy. Start flipping. Here are the applications, and this is what you're going to see. So that's why it sells so well, because we dentists like picture books, okay? So here's the, you know, the lipping on this condyle. Now, we take another case looking very similar, no translation, loose body, subchondral cyst or erosion on there. Guess what? It was a loose body. Anybody old enough to remember good and plenty? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> That's what it looks like, a little good and plenty in there. That was a licorice thing. But look at the alteration of the glenoid fossa, and there's the loose body. And I've shown, and there's osteophytes, okay? I mean... When you can see it in 3D, doesn't it make reality reality? And oh, by the way, you remember learning in dental school uh, uh, Clark's rule, uh, buckle object rule, tube shift rule, slob. Who learned slob rule? 
Yeah, the younger people. You're welcome. We came up, not me, but we did that in San Antonio, Texas. Bob Langley and a couple others came up with the same on lingual opposite on buckle. And when you took a, one more posterior, if it moved in those directions, you know which side it was on. It all goes away now. You do a 3D image and you can see where the hell everything is. Okay, I don't even have the pictures in here to show you the case I usually show, but there's the little loose body. I've had surgeons who do not want to go in the temporomandibular joint anymore. They don't do surgery there. We'll say, yeah, I could do a little trephination procedure, tease that out, a little steroid lavage, and basically that patient wouldn't click, clack, hurt, restrict opening periodically, intermittent clicking, you know. So they're saying, yeah, with this, I, I might do something that's, you know, less invasive and more productive. Lipping is, this is a great dictionary, by the way. It's just called biology-online.org. Um, real good one to store. But lipping is the formation of a lip-like structure at the end of a bone. So, you know, there's the one I showed you. This is a humerus. Look at this. See the lipping there? Shoulder joint. And then, of course, you can have loose bodies. You know, in the t I see these all the time. If there are multiple ones, uni or bilateral, you could have synovial chondromatosis. That's, but look at, you don't think... You know that's going to hurt, right? <laughs> but in your knee joint, well, why the heck wouldn't you think this would hurt, you know, or restrict your opening? So anyway, I'm going to skip this one, showing lots of loose bodies and things. Here's the one I was talking to you about. This is a loose body in the atlantoaxial junction. There's atlas again. There's C2, or the dens portion, and then uh, at axis, okay? Soft palate, uvula, hyoid, vertebral body, spinous processes, clivus. I said in an audience one time, I said, I don't know what clivus stands for. You know, I, I just don't know where the derivation. And some guy, one of our colleagues, says it means slope in Latin. I went, I guess that's why I studied Latin in high school in Canada, right? Anyway, I always remember it this way. It's clivus, it's like a tall guy in Kentucky, you know. Hey, clivus, let's go fishing. <laughs> right? Now you'll remember that all the time. And by the way, see this area here? This is the cella tersica, right? The carotid artery comes up past the, the, the condyle in this region up here, and it's going to make a loop like that right there. I'll show you the cartoons in a second. But there's another loose body. This is where I wanted to get to. I'm going to spend all the time on this, on diabetes and the changes we see on comb beam. You, you remember that. And there's the buccal object rule gone. You know, this, this tooth number 16, or for my Canadian friends, 28, is impeded from eruption by a supernumerary. How easy is that to die? Man, think about that on a panoramic or a Ceph. Good luck, you know? Like the movie Taken, good luck, no. Okay, so you, you, oh, I've only got a small field of view. Yeah, Sherlock, but when you move it back here to capture a third molar, you're gonna get airway, you're gonna get some of the vertebral bodies, which you have to know some stuff about. And oh, by the way, if you moved it up to get, capture the temporomandibular joint, there's the sphenoid sinus, there's the cella tersica. So even in Canada, A, eh, when they have an eight by eight and they do condyles, they get all the same structures that I'm showing you the important changes in. And it's surprising because, well, it's not surprising, it's fun for me. Hey, guys that I teach up there, I'll say, when you move it around and you see the cella, if you see those carotid calcifications I've been showing you, drop me a line, <laughs> and they do, almost after every course, you know. Here's what it looks like. This is still thin slice. You can even see it. This is the carotid artery channel right here, and then it bends forward. Well, if you see them outlining the walls, you just think diabetes, okay? Just, just say it, you know, just in your head. Diabetes, diabetes, all right? Here's probably the most confusing image I'll show you all afternoon. What do you think you're looking at? What do you think this is right here? Somebody say it. I know you're going to say it. Oh, now I got you all. I, I set you up for failure, right? What do you think that is? What hole? Did someone say external auditory canal? That's what everybody guesses. No, you're looking from the foot end on these images. This is a small field of view. I didn't crop it. This is a four by four. That's the condylar head. That's the medial wall of the glenoid fossa. That's the carotid artery canal, and that's the internal jugular canal. Do you not think those are important? <laughs> you 
you know, and in the textbook what I do is I, I slabbed it out to show where everything is. I, I show you all the foramina in the floor. This is how you see it when you go thin slice without the arrows, okay? Condyle you'd get, sinus you'd get, sphenoid sinus, external auditory canal, mastoid air cells, and you'd look at that and go, what the hell is that? No. <laughs> There's the pterygoid process. A good comedy, you have to repeat things later. In the, yeah. All right, so what I did was I took a four-shot sort of in the, in the software and showed you how it opens up along the floor. We're still seeing all the condylar head, right? But this is the carotid canal. And where does it come up? It comes up right, this is sphenoid sinus. This is all carotid canal. I thickened it out to sh sort of show you what we used to look at, you know, the Rorschach test. And this is what it looks like in a slab rendering. That's the carotid artery in the groove in the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. So this is all in the text. We, here's one cartoon. We all looked at dried skulls in dental school, most of us. Here's the protocol for a medical radiologist that's looking at the paracella. It's called the paracella protocol. They're looking for all of these things, primarily pituitary changes. They're looking for signal voids and flow, broad, but look at the carotid artery. It's gonna have loops in different places. Up here, it's near the clinoid process, so we call these segments the paraclinoid. These are the paracellar. And I see the calcifications more there than I do in the neck. So let's show them. Thin slice, coronal plane of section, condyle, foramen of valley, and you see these little lines and you go, OMG, that might be what Dr. You know, brain dead guy showed me. And so you scroll in there, you see some loops, okay, without the arrows. That's what you're looking at. So, remember this one? That's in the carotid artery, isn't it? You know why it looks like that? Because it's, you know, it's sort of at the beginning of that canal, or maybe the end, but not up here. Here's that. Same person, that's the area that it comes up, that carotid opening, and there's what it looked like. <laughs> it's a stent. They didn't stent them down in the neck. The problems were up there, so they stented them high up. And what kind of image did I make next when you want to show calcifications? <laughs> she's, she's, like, she's like like Pavlov. I don't mean that. In the, that's the what I want. That's what I'm looking for, that response. So I made a MIP image. There's your stent. Kind of looks like a stent, doesn't it? <laughs> and now you see the condylar heads. Ugly for diagnosis. Now, can anybody tell me if there's any other finding that might correlate to this in this image? Yes, right here. There's a small carotid plaque in the patient's left, probably internal carotid. Okay? So you'll see these. You're looking, at, and this is unenhanced conventional CT. Medicine has been poo-pooing. Oh yeah, we see those all the time. Monkberg's calcification, you know, don't worry about it. This is hook 'em horns if you're from Texas, and this is BS, okay? This is important stuff. And you're gonna see it on your comb beam exams without the arrows. So you might see a plaque. I'm not so worried about this. Yeah, I'm gonna send them off. The, the recommendation in the software says, patient being referred to their primary care provider for evaluation of hypertension and stroke risk. Well, what, what could you do if you wanted to evaluate hypertension on that patient in your office? Take a blood pressure, right? Before and after. But this calcification, when I turned it on coronal, did a MIP image, notice it's going up and down the wall. Now I'm, now I'm perplexed, <laughs> okay? I'm like, maybe this could be in the medial layer. So... I did a 3D and I can see the, almost like loops around there. So they're not gonna die from their periodontal disease. Well, they might, <laughs> but you know, they've got plaques that are more consistent with diabetes. Now I wanna show you this because I put this at 60 millimeter thickness. A typical focal trough in a pan is about 25 to 30. I still couldn't see the calcification. So you're going to see it, it was, you know, I had to do the 3D in order to see it, okay? You're going to see these. This, these are some failing implants. There's probably some peri-implantitis. They took the image. They saw this circular thing. It's not, it's not just, you know, some part of the hyoid. You look at it, and you go, hmm, I better do an MIP. And that's what it looks like when you do the MIP. 
And this is what it looked like going up and down the walls. Just a very thin hint of it here. But this is, this is a pattern now. This is a structure to this calcification, not a diffuse amorphous plaque seen on a panoramic. And by the way, you know where most of the articles came from? And one of those a good friend of mine, Laura Carter, she and a guy named Art Friedland from a San Diego uh, VA hospital came out and studied a population of our native peoples here, the Pima Indians, highest incidence of type 2 diabetes mellitus of any ethnic group worldwide. Okay? And they had, they reported all these carotid plaques and oh, hypertension. And I'm going, OMG, I, I was thinking more of WTF, you know, I'm going, do you realize that these calcification, so I want to actually go back, I would love to get, and, and uh, a periodontist friend of mine, uh, Bob Jenko, you probably heard that name, older than me, believe it or not, and he's still working full time at uh, SUNY State University of New York, periodontist that just basically changed the world with all of their periodontal studies and, and uh, the pathogens. He said, I, we've still got all of our, all of those, because uh, Carter was at SUNY at the time, we've still got all those images. I would like to go back over those images and ca categorize, I want a graduate student to do it, I don't have the time, okay, uh, categorize these calcifications and see how many of them might have been true diabetes, okay, because they probably have some uh, clinical history, at least if not serology, but look here, they've got them up here too. So if you've got calcifications that look like they're organized and they're in four different locations in a patient and it's on your comb beam, thicken it out, prove it to yourself, look in the history, they're either diabetic that they've already told you and they're not under control, they're not compliant, or they're undiagnosed. And it's close, with the pre-diabetic and diabetes, we're talking close to 100 million people by the year 20, I think it was 2020, might be 2030. All right, so some fast facts. Here, I put them in, fast facts. 30 million have diabetes, almost 10% of the population. 23 million diagnosed, okay, undiagnosed, 7.2. So I guess it might be 100, no, it's, yeah, sorry, I take that 100 million back. I think it's supposed to be like 200 million diabetics worldwide. So yes, it's mostly a North American thing, Ohio Valley, you know, diet and, you know, change your diet but 100 million worldwide, so that means that there's other peoples out there that are, you know, living like we do, you know. And I'm not giving up my glass of wine at the end, I'm sorry. Actually, wine's really good for, you know, all the resveratrol and the, I'm, I'm actually balancing that between the cardioprotective properties with the, but actually my downfall is single malt, so if anybody wants to buy me a single malt at the bar after, I'm open, okay. Otherwise, I'm going home to have one with my wife, so. Pre-diabetes, here we go again, 84 million, okay? That's where I got the number from because the next one is 23, so there's the 100 million. So 84, you know, 18 years of over, 23 over 65, I'm in that group now. <laughs> and here's, the, here's a little bit of the science behind it. I've been following this, like I said, since 1981, and I actually found this type of calcification in the facial arteries, okay? But your tunic intima is this layer. These are the muscle cells in the tunica media. Muscle cells, why? Less blood required, close it down. More blood required, open her up, okay? Well, what happens if you have calcification around the entire medial wall? There's the, the schmutz inside. This is an arthroma. This is, this is an amorphous plaque. There might be some calcification in there. It's blockage, yeah but blood can get through. This is more significant. And by the way, the science and literature I'm reading now is talking about the signaling that's happening between these two layers. These are not independent activities, okay? So what's happening is you're looking at this here. Make sense? Okay. And there's your condyle, just in case you forgot where you were, because some of you aren't used to looking at you know, comb beam CT. So four loops. Why? Because that's, that's where it comes forward, goes up, comes forward again. Okay? So here's the thing. You get these biologic calcifications, physiologic, bone, okay, or pineal gland or choroid plexuses in your comb beam scans. I didn't even get to show you that. 
ectopic, into soft tissue or CV. If it's in vascular, intima, atherosclerosis. Media-based, blah, 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 blah. Diabetes, chronic renal disease. And I found another, this is, I don't know. I don't know anything about this path. I'm going to be working through the literature again. But basically, with all these uh, uh, enzymes and other characters that are acting, this is how we end up getting to the vascular calcification within cells, within tissues. So, you know, there's, there's a lot going on there that they're now just sorting out. So the activation of these enzymes, including this one, induces vascular calcification in diabetes mellitus. So I'm just, just starting my way. But watch this pathway. If it's medial, blah, 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 altered low heart failure. Here's where the linkage is now between, you know, medial arterial calcification, heart failure as a cause of death. Intimal, yeah, you could throw a piece and, and rupture and, and die, but mostly it's just going to cause some local ischemia. And, of course, small vessels affected first. So I go in. This was a while back. I find uh, this is a really good journal, British Journal Circulation. So, of course, they name everything else different than we North Americans. And you damn colonials in Canada, too, eh? Um, thank you very much. So here's the deal. They call this calcific atherosclerosis, intimal layer, hypertension. You come down here. Oh, I meant to extend that box. I made it bigger, and I forgot to extend the red. Calcific medial vasculopathy, or what I call medial arterial calcification, and everybody else does in North America, but we all agree on Munkberg, because we all learned that in school. Tunica media, type 2 diabetes, end-stage renal disease, amputation. So I've been on this soapbox for a long time, and now that I've got an article written, I must have 400 cases okay, of carotid plaques and or you know, the medial arterial calcification. I've got the article written. I need, I need to have another co-author, and I've approached several people, and they, oh, yeah, we'll help you work on that, and then they just bail. They don't, you know, I don't have time. When I write this and when it goes into the literature, it's going to change some patterns of treatment, I think, extensively. So if it's unilateral, irregular shaped, amorphous, it's plain old atherosclerosis, an arterial plaque. It's bilateral, circumferential, it's probably MAC. MAC being related to those two things and eventually amputation. So I'm going to be just like the rest of the folks today. I talk so fast, I'm going to finish you early, and you're probably ready for that too. But uh, I'll show you a couple last things. That is a carotid artery. Okay. That is a carotid artery. And guess where that is? Is that out here where it's supposed to be? No, it's in the posterior pharyngeal wall. Is that significant? Absolutely. If you're going to have surgery back there, and they're going in without knowing where that, because they take aberrant path rays once in a while, those, those internal carotids, and it's coming up, and so somebody has tonsils out, whoosh, and a bleed out, okay? So, now, what do you think those are? Trichinosis, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's not what I, what, is that what I meant? Which is the one that's parasitic? Is that a trichinosis? Damn, I remembered something, a synapse worked. Okay. Well, these are your facial arteries. I have these on film-based panoramics. And you know what I did with those 13 I found out of the 3,000 discarded panoramics? This was at the Audi Murphy Hospital in San Antonio, 1981. I took those 13 cases, and in that VA system, they may not give great care in certain places, but they keep good records, <laughs> okay? So I pulled the medical charts for those 13 individuals, and they all had arteriosclerosis, chronic kidney failure, or diabetes. Some of them had both. So I thought, hmm, that's odd. Uh, I'm, I'm there as a, a non-traditional student because I'd had seven years of private practice. But look at the facial artery. Doesn't it look like a facial artery? Look where it is, right over where teeth reside. Okay? Here it is bilaterally. In what kind of image class? <laughs> mip, mip. Somebody, when I was giving a talk like that one time, I... I said, you mip it, and then somebody out there in the audience started going, mip it, mip it good, you know, <laughs> like the old Devo. Anyway, we don't, there's some more. This is all the same patient, by the way. I mean, this guy's got problems, right? And this is at the macro level. You know, you guys are at the biologic level, and you understand some of the 
pathways and mediators, inflammatory mediators. I'm, I'm just a picture guy, you know. I'm a radiologist that has been looking at patterns my entire life and putting two and two together. So, all right, I don't want you to be intimidated. You just need to get educated. And this is my last video, which I think you'll enjoy. I could be wrong. Now, just set the tone for this. Um, there's football and there's football. And there's also a thing called rugger. Well, the New Zealand All Blacks, okay, are a rugger team that played in North America, in the United States for the first time ever last year. And they're world renowned. And what they do is they, does anyone know what the haka is? Yeah, the haka is a warrior chant, Maori chant, to intimidate your foe so that they're so, affright so frightened they run away. You don't have to fight. So they make their gestures big, they stick their tongue out as far as they can, they yell as loud as they can, and they do this before every rugger game, okay? So here we go. This is the New Zealand All Blacks playing the Scots. Scottish response. William Lawson's No Rules, Great Scotch. I knew you'd like it. Now, are, are there any women in the audience that were offended by that? Because I could take it out for the next time I lecture. No, okay, good. It's not my commercial, okay? <laughs> I'm not even going to repeat what she said. No, she said, we want the other view, okay? All right. <laughs> you naughty, naughty, I'll call day. Uh, so this is over my garden wall, okay? This is a, a saguaro that's in the neighbor's yard. We have several in ours, but... You have no idea how long it took for me to find the streaking in the sky, which is actually in the Arizona flag. You've seen the red, yellow, and blue flag, and there's the streaking. So I, I finally captured that. This is the website again. I just put this in at the end just so, to remind you that there are lots of articles there. They're all free. You know, none of these are you buy on, on site, but there are links to the different products, so you can go there and actually, uh, you know, Complete your education. Thank you. And of course, there's questions, maybe. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to come up and ask of Dr. Miles? Can you just whisper it in my ear? <laughs> what do you feel is currently the, the, the optimal cone beam machine on the market today? <laughs> Did everyone hear that question? Yeah. I used to, I taught digital for many years and some guy, usually it was Texas or, yeah. you know, Atlanta. You know, some of the Hinman, they'd say, I heard what you said about all them machines, but if you had to pick one, which one would it be? I can't tell you that, okay? Um, you practice differently than everybody else. Everybody practices differently. What you do, and, and there isn't a bad machine, okay? And remember, I'm reading third party, so I get all the different volumes from all the different machines, and I can do a relatively fair comparison, okay? There are two or three that in a smaller group, the, not in public, I would say these I think have a slightly better image quality and I can tell you what those are. Um, but almost all Combi machine at this point in time are good. There's bad local levels of support, there always is. You hold their feet to the fire, you make sure you get trained, your staff gets trained, um, and to those of you who are thinking about doing it, you need to go through and do a critical review of your practice and say, what are the tasks that I do in my office that I think comb beam would help me be a better clinician, help me make a better clinical decision? When you go through and do that and do the sort of numbers for six months or whatever, you will surprise yourself. You'll go, holy crap, this, this machine that costs the same as an Audi TT or maybe even a Mercedes 350, you know, it's going to pay for itself in 18 months. 
and I'm going to be a better clinician for it. So uh, I'll tell you later. Okay. Yes. Mike, Mike, otherwise you won't pick it up. His name isn't Mike. Uh, <laughs> Darcy. No. <laughs> Good one. Thank you. In your experience, Dr. Miles, since it appears to be very vast for a cone beam interpretation, so this might be on the low side, but what is the average amount of time you feel is necessary to do a thorough, proper interpretation of the entire examination and dictate it? Okay, good, great question. What I'll do is I'll, I'll say that the most popular size field of view is an eight by eight, eight centimeter by eight centimeter, although most people are going bigger now, okay, including endodontists. It would take, with a level of comfort that, that I have, uh, probably about 15, to 20 minutes to actually go through the volume. So once I've done that, of course, I have to compile, I have to bring up the last report, put in patient name and change things, put the images in after I narrate the things. So probably another 10 to 15 minutes to actually do a, a good formal structured report, which is 30 minutes a case, basically. And I take it from that context that you would probably advise most dentists medical legally not to do an exam, look at what they want to look, and leave the rest of the exam uninterpreted, or the liability would be huge. Mr. Correct? Not, here's the, I got 20 bucks here. That, no. Uh, <laughs> no, here's, here's my deal. I've never said that every comb beam data set needs to be looked at by a normaxillofacial radiologist or a medical radiologist. You have to train yourself to a comfort level where you're comfortable going through it so that you're not going to miss anything. You're not required to diagnose anything from, a, from any x-ray modality. What you are required to do is review the volume. If you see something that looks odd, different, unusual, pathologic, you need to refer. That's the ADA standard of care. Having said that, there are gonna be people in this room that basically do more than say three or four cases, five cases a week. Well, if you're doing five a week and each one of those is taking you half an hour, that's two and a half hours of just reviewing comb beam, okay? There's a lot of people say, I don't have the time for that, and nor do I have the comfort level. Yes, then you would actually think about referring out. Uh, that happened to me by one of the oral maxillofacial surgeons in town here, very high-end high guy, very cool guy, good, good clinician. Dale, I'm thinking of buying a combi machine. Which one would you buy? It's not him, but that was the same question. I said, well, we talk and talk. Turns out, size of field of view for what he wanted to do. I said, an iCat you know, at the time. That would be good. I said, so I'll tell you who it is. It was Reed. I said, Reed Day. I said, Reed, who's going to do your, read your cases for you? He says, well, Dale, I'm, I'm an MD as well. I can look at these scans. So I said, okay, how many do you think you'll do a week? Because he was going to get do them for other people. He said, I don't know. I said, well, eight, ten. He said, yeah, ten, ten to fifteen a week. I said, so Reed, you, you mean to tell me you're going to take 30 minutes on each of 15 cases every week to go through the volume so you don't miss anything? And he goes, Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, now he never came back to me for the reads. I think he ended up uh, sort of uh, working with beam readers. But one thing that I, I and this is going to sound like, hey, I'd rather see you do it this way than this way. Um, first of all, beam readers copied my structured report. M not mine. There were four of us in a group that came up with that. And even in medicine, they don't all use a structure. You've seen a medical, like a CT or MR study, right, that comes back to you. It's a narrative, right? And where are the images? They reside in the hospital or wherever. If you get a structured report, it's better communication. If you get a structured report, it means somebody looked at everything. If you get a structured report with images and arrows on it, I mean, to me, that's, that's where a lot of medical radiology people are going now. It's taking a lot more time. And then they're using a cloud to put all that up on there so that when you log in on your dashboard, you see your report, you pull it down, you see the image stack that we've created with our arrows, okay, or the MIP images, and you scroll through it and say, that's important, that's important, and download those. So this whole profession, our side's way behind. Our, you know, medicine's been doing this for years. So I think we're getting to the level of understanding that we've got to be the same players you know, as our well, medical Well, I'll college. take 20 minutes to do an echocardiogram thoroughly, and this thing has 10 times more information on it. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Good point. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I do have the 20 bucks for you there. But you'll have to buy me my scotch with that 20 bucks that I get. <laughs>